In the summer of 1176, while Saladin was campaigning against his Zengid rivals near Aleppo, Baldwin IV of Jerusalem came of age and took full power as king. His first act as an independent ruler was to refuse to ratify his regent's peace treaty with Saladin. Instead, the young king gathered his army and attacked Saladin's lands around Damascus. By this, the young king revealed his attitudes. He didn't want to allow Saladin to continue to gain in power and become an ever greater threat to the kingdom of Jerusalem. He wanted to take the fight to the enemy. To help execute his policy, Baldwin appointed as Seneschal his uncle, Jocelyn of Courtenay, a competent, intelligent man who was absolutely loyal to the young king. Baldwin's new government immediately curbed Saladin's ambitions. The Sultan had to stop trying to conquer Aleppo and instead had to make peace with the Zengids. However, while marching back from Aleppo, Saladin attacked the assassin fort of Masyaf. The Sultan was determined to destroy this mysterious order, for recently they'd made an attempt on his life. Chillingly, the attempt was made by Mamluks, thought to have been absolutely loyal to the Ayyubid dynasty. The Sultan was concerned that the assassins had infiltrated other ranks among his inner circle, and he perhaps thought the only way to eliminate the threat was to destroy them completely. On August the 1st, 1176, King Baldwin IV assembled the Jerusalem army, joined with Count Raymond's force from Tripoli, and raided Saladin's territory around the Bakar Valley. Saladin's nephew, Turan Shah, assembled an army and tried to interrupt the Frankish raid, but the young king defeated him soundly at the Battle of Baalbek. Saladin got word of this disaster and immediately abandoned his campaign against the assassins. Once more, the young Baldwin was interfering with his plans. These two summer campaigns, including a battlefield victory against the Ayyubids, amounted to Baldwin IV's first experiences at war. Surely the king relied on the knowledge of his veteran commanders, but it was an impressive debut for the teenage monarch. Baldwin refused to allow his disease to inhibit him, taking the field with his men and leading from the saddle, a sword in his grasp and an iron helmet on his head. Meanwhile, famine in Syria forced Saladin to retire with his army to Egypt. Baldwin took the opportunity to strike an alliance with the Byzantine emperor. The agreement established Manuel as the overall protector of Eastern Christendom, making him overlord of the Crusader states. Saladin watched all these developments carefully. He constructed a navy and began to strengthen the defenses of his chief cities in Egypt. In the spring of 1177, King Baldwin made Reynold of Châtillon his fourth greatest vassal by granting him the hand of Stephanie of Milly, heiress to the frontier territories of Transjordan, including the great desert castle of Karak. From here, Reynold could harass Saladin's supply lines between Damascus and Egypt. Saladin's correspondence from this time is filled with complaints of his difficulties in transporting men and provisions between Syria and Egypt. Reynold was clearly a man trusted by Baldwin. Like Baldwin, Reynold understood that the key to reducing Ayyubid power was to disrupt Saladin's ability to secure both Egypt and Syria simultaneously. If Saladin were allowed to continue to expand his Syrian power, especially by capturing Aleppo, Jerusalem would come under grave threat. Thus, Reynold from his castle of Karak became a thorn in Saladin's side. William of Tyre disliked Reynold, but still described him as a man of proven loyalty and unusual steadfastness of character. Then, in August of 1177, Count Philip of Flanders, one of the most powerful men in Christendom, arrived with his army at Arca. Like many Westerners, Philip came as a crusader and as a pilgrim. He intended to visit the holy shrines and to join the Knights of the Crusader States in a campaign against the Muslims. The inhabitants of the Crusader Kingdom 
welcomed Philip's arrival. King Baldwin in particular viewed Philip's visit as a godsend. Recently, Baldwin's leprosy had grown worse. The Count of Flanders seemed like the solution to the king's trials. Baldwin offered the Count his very kingdom, requesting that Philip take on the burden of the crown and the defense of Jerusalem. Philip declined, announcing that his visit would be brief and that he must soon return to Flanders. Baldwin therefore asked that the Count join him in invading Saladin's power center of Egypt. Philip refused this as well, desiring instead to help Bohemond of Antioch on the Syrian front. Disappointed, King Baldwin nevertheless tried to bolster the Count's efforts and reinforced Philip's army with 100 knights and 2,000 infantry. It must have been difficult for the young leper king when the great Count of Flanders marched north. Count Philip joined Raymond III of Tripoli and Bohemond III of Antioch for an assault on the Syrian fortress of Harim. From Egypt, Saladin monitored all this. The Sultan understood that it was in his interest to eliminate this new power in Jerusalem as quickly as possible. In the autumn of 1177, with the bulk of the Crusader forces campaigning to the north in Syria, Saladin seized the opportunity. He assembled the full strength of his Egyptian forces. So large was the Sultan's army that its supply needs caused food prices to skyrocket in Egypt. The chronicler William of Tyre insists that Saladin fielded 26,000 cavalry. Today, some historians estimate Saladin's forces closer to 12 or 15,000. But even at such a size, the Muslim army was tremendous and capable of conquering the kingdom of Jerusalem. On November 18th, the Sultan crossed the Egyptian frontier into Christian territory. Knowing that Crusader forces were reduced, Saladin moved at a relaxed pace up the coast into Palestine, ravaging and burning farmland and collecting booty. Grandmaster Odo of saint Amand assembled the Knights Templar at their fortress of Gaza, but Saladin bypassed the Templar stronghold and drove for Ascalon, one of Jerusalem's key coastal cities. Meanwhile, King Baldwin gathered the few troops available to him. Joining the king were leading barons Baldwin of Ramla and Balian of Ibeline, as well as Reynon of Châtillon. The crusaders had with them their most precious relic, the true cross believed to be wood from the very cross of Jesus, carried by Bishop Alberts of Bethlehem. Altogether, the young king's cavalry was composed of only around 450 knights and a few thousand infantry. The Sultan approached Ascalon on November 24th. Baldwin knew himself to be dangerously outnumbered and so retired behind the city's walls. Now fully confident that Baldwin could not challenge him, Saladin dispatched raiding parties inside the countryside. Some Muslim contingents reached the very walls of Jerusalem itself. News of the Sultan's marauding troops spread fear throughout the kingdom. In Jerusalem, the citizens hid in the Tower of David while the inhabitants of Ramla abandoned their city to take refuge in the fortified port of Jaffa or at the castle of Mirabel. However, King Baldwin was determined to resist Saladin. He dispatched a message summoning the Templars from Gaza. Soon, Grandmaster Odo of saint Amand rode up before Ascalon with around 80 Templar knights. Bolstered by the Templars, King Baldwin led his army out of Ascalon to seek battle. They marched up the coast to Ibelin and then swung inland. On November 25th, King Baldwin and his knights advanced on the enemy. Saladin was surprised to learn that the Christians were approaching. The Sultan was in the middle of moving his army across a ravine near the castle of Mongizar, a few miles southeast of Ramla. At once, Saladin ordered the beating of war drums, the signal for his troops to reassemble. The Muslim troops scrambled to array themselves for battle. Arab chronicler Ibn al athir records the scene. The next thing they knew, the Franks were upon them with their battalions and their champions. Saladin only had a part of his army, since many of his men had dispersed in search of booty. When he saw the Franks, he stood firm with the men he had. Although King Baldwin had effectively achieved surprise, 
Saladin had time to get a good portion of his army into position. Ibn Shaddad, one of Saladin's closest servants and his biographer, tells us that the Sultan himself later explained the situation to him. The Muslims had drawn up for battle, and when the enemy approached, some of our men decided that the right wing should cross to the left, and the left cross toward the center, in order that when battle was joined, they might have at their backs a hill known as Ramla land. While they were occupied in this maneuver, the Franks charged them. William of Tyre also indicates that Saladin managed to achieve some level of battle readiness. He writes, The enemy's forces, who had ventured some distance away to seek booty, began to arrive from different directions, a circumstance which greatly increased Saladin's strength. William of Tyre next describes the start of the clash. The ranks of fighters on both sides now gradually approached each other and a battle ensued, which was at first indecisive, but the forces were very unequal. The Christians, however, strengthened by the grace shed upon them from on high, soon began to press on with ever-increasing boldness. Saladin's lines were broken and, after a terrible slaughter, forced to flee. As both William and Ibn Shaddad point out, it was the charge of the Christian cavalry that shattered Saladin's lines. A pilgrim present for the battle later recounted to the Dean of London the attack led by the Grand Master of the Templars, Odo of Saint Armand. He took himself into battle with his men, strengthened by the sign of the cross. Spurring all together as one man, they made a charge, turning neither to the left nor to the right. Recognizing the battalion from which Saladin commanded, they manfully approached it, immediately penetrated it, incessantly knocked down, scattered, struck and crushed. Saladin's Mamluk bodyguards, wearing yellow silk over their breastplates, were slain almost to a man. The Sultan himself was nearly killed by the charge of the Templars, but he managed to mount a racing camel and rush away to safety with only a few companions. The Battle of Montgizad was a great triumph for King Baldwin IV. The Crusaders chased down the fleeing enemy, slaying them all the way to a nearby marsh. The pursuit lasted into the night. Crusaders hunted down the remnants of Saladin's army for miles. William of Tyre writes that, The king went back to Ascalon, where he awaited the return of his forces who had pursued the fugitives by different roads. Within four days, they had all arrived, loaded with plunder, carrying tents and driving before them slaves, troops of camels and horses. They came, according to the words of the prophet, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. In their rush for safety, the Muslim survivors abandoned booty, prisoners and weapons. Saladin's own journey across the Sinai Desert was perilous with Bedouin harassing him and his almost defenseless companions. The flight was particularly difficult as violent storms raged for 10 days, causing many fugitives to get lost, only to be captured by crusaders a few days later. William of Tyre recalls, Many in their ignorance of the localities and thinking that they were on the way home presented themselves in our villages either to travelers or to those who were hunting them. On reaching the Egyptian frontier, Saladin dispatched messengers on camels to Cairo, assuring any would-be rebels that he was alive. Once at Cairo, he used carrier pigeons to proclaim his survival throughout Egypt. Nevertheless, the defeat was extremely humiliating for the Sultan, and his prestige was damaged in the eyes of both his subjects and his enemies. King Baldwin and his men had achieved a great victory. Saladin's casualties were immense, with only about 10% of his forces managing to escape. As a result, the Kingdom of Jerusalem was saved. That a small army of crusaders and Templars, led by a 16-year-old leper, achieved all this is truly remarkable. But Baldwin knew that there would be more challenges in the future from Saladin. The Sultan had lost his army, but his immense resources in Egypt and Damascus would allow him to rebuild quickly. 
To prepare, the king began in October of 1178 to build a new castle at Jacob's Ford in the Jordan River between Lake Hule and the Sea of Galilee. In this project, Baldwin collaborated with the Knights Templar, who already held an important castle at Safar and were often charged with guarding vulnerable frontier positions. For some time, Jacob's Ford had been left unfortified, but with Saladin in control of Damascus and the Crusaders unable to recover Banias, Baldwin believed that the site had to be protected. A castle in this position would hinder an invasion of Galilee and provide a base for raiding into Hauran. By the spring of 1179, the inner wall had been raised, but the outer wall still needed to be finished. The planned fortress would be one of the strongest in the region. The labor took place while Saladin was besieging the rebel emir Ibn al-Muqadam at Baalbek, but the sultan was watching the project with concern. For him, the castle was an intolerable threat to his territory. He offered King Baldwin 60,000 dinars to destroy the structure, and then 100,000. Baldwin refused both proposals. Saladin put this money instead toward a military solution, dispatching raiding parties to harass the territory around Jacob's Ford. In May 1179, the Sultan launched a force to test the castle's defenses. But the real showdown came on June 10th, when Saladin's army confronted a Frankish force at the Battle of Marj Ayun. The battle took place between the Leontes River and the Upper Jordan, northwest of Banias. Saladin opened the campaign by situating his army at Banias. From here, he dispatched raiding parties to burn the villages to the east of Sidon. King Baldwin assembled his army and marched to relieve the threatened district. The Christians set out from Tiberias toward the Templar castle of Safad to Toron and then to the eastern flank of the coastal plain overlooking Marj Ayun. From here, the Crusaders could see the tents of the Sultan's main army. The king, along with his commanders, decided to launch an immediate attack, hoping to catch the Muslims off guard. The Christian cavalry advanced ahead of their infantry, hoping to launch a decisive charge. Initially, this is exactly what happened. Baldwin's army caught Saladin's detachments as they returned from raiding the villages. Unprepared, the Muslim horsemen were quickly defeated and fled. The Franks now moved to wrap up the campaign. Part of the Christian army advanced on the Sultan's camp, while Raymond of Tripoli and the Templars occupied the high ground between Marj Ayun and the Litani Gorge. The infantry gathered spoil and rested. However, Saladin then executed a clever surprise assault. Quickly reassembling his main force, the Sultan advanced rapidly on his enemies. The Crusaders were caught unprepared and badly defeated. The Templars were at the forefront of the fighting, and many of them were captured or slain, including their Grand Master, Odo of saint Armand. King Baldwin himself barely escaped with his life. His illness rendered him unable to mount his horse, and he had to be carried to safety by his knights. Many of the Crusaders took refuge at the castle of Beaufort. Nevertheless, Christian losses were considerable. It was a spectacular victory for Saladin and a serious reverse for the leper king. The Sultan was able to replenish his coffers by ransoming his Frankish prisoners for sacks of gold. But when Saladin offered a ransom deal to the Templar Grand Master, Odo answered gruffly, a Templar's only ransom is his dagger. Saladin sent the defiant Templar to end his days in a Damascus prison. On August 24th, Saladin launched an all-out assault on the castle at Jacob's Ford. Within five days, he'd taken it. His men slaughtered many of those they found inside, whether combatants or non-combatants. The survivors they sent to the slave markets. When it was all over, a smouldering ruin lay at the site of King Baldwin's splendid castle. Saladin had inflicted a major reverse on the kingdom's defenses. However, the Muslim army suffered from an outbreak of plague, which killed many of Saladin's troops, including 10 of his chief emirs. 
Still, the campaign was a clear success for the Sultan. He followed it up by raiding the farmlands around Tiberias, Tyre, and Beirut to spread terror and a sense of insecurity throughout the kingdom. Baldwin IV showed incredible resolve throughout this difficult period, but the campaigning of 1179 took a hard toll on his health. While fighting alongside his men in the muddy, rugged terrain along the Jordan, the king's condition deteriorated, and by the end of the year, his leprosy had greatly advanced. Baldwin felt himself near death and took steps to secure his kingdom, even as his great enemy Saladin grew ever more powerful. Next time, we'll follow the leper king into the most trying period of his reign, when his body failed him and all seemed lost.